Good evening. Thank you all for coming. Um, we've got some technical difficulties right now, but thanks for sitting through that. I'd also like to thank the sponsors who made this um, awesome presentation possible. Um, Engineers Without Borders, ISU, um, ISU Ganda, the International Student Council, Student International Medical Aid Club, UNICEF at ISU, and the Committee on Lectures, which is funded by GSB. Um, tonight, you're here to see Scott Lacey, obviously. Scott Lacey moved to Mali in 1994 as a Peace Corps volunteer, returned in 2002 as a Fulbright Scholar, and continues to work extensively in the West African country. Lacey's nonprofit, African Sky, emerged from a project to build a three-room schoolhouse in his rural host village. The community development organization has service programs in education, community health, food security, and the community arts in Mali, with a focus on sustainability living. At Emory and Fairfield Universities, Scott Lacey has researched such issues as sustainable development, food production, and the intellectual property rights associated with participatory plant breeding. He earned his Ph.D. in anthropology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, where he taught in the Department of Black Studies as a faculty fellow. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Scott Lacey. How are we? All right. It's unbelievable that at 7 o'clock on a perfectly good day, so many people would come here to talk about Molly. Thank you. It's fantastic. Thank you, Dan, for uh, helping to set this uh, visit up, and just thank you, Iowa State. Um, I'm thrilled to be here for many reasons. I would say the first one is that I'm kind of an Iowa State fan. Um, when you look at what this university does, and, and I do like my football, my sports, but I'm going in a different direction. <laughs> I love Iowa State because, as an outsider, when I check out the website and I look at what you're doing, when I talk to my colleagues at Engineers Without Borders at other institutions about this institution and about EWB here, um, it's nothing but praise and excitement. And it's just finally a great thing for me to be here to uh, share an evening with you. And also, I must say, too, it's, it's a real pleasure and an honor to, to be able to, to, to come by and see an old friend, uh, Richard Lassar, who has definitely been an inspiration to me with, uh, with some of the great work that you and your students have done. So for all of you that have worked in Mali, Thank you very much. For all of you that worked in the world, thank you very much. Let's talk a little bit about making poverty history. Yeah? All right. Moving forward, guys. Let's see if we can make this work. I have this problem where sometimes I'll point at the screen. So you guys, you're the technical people. You just say, anthropologist, that way, right? All right. Let's get started. What brings us together? Why are we here tonight? And I know there's this thing called Poverty Awareness Week, and that's kind of the, ostensibly, that's why we're here. But really, what, why is it that we're here? Like, for example, my friend in the front, like, why are you here tonight? I work with people in my country. So you work with uh, po impoverished populations, but where? Indonesia. Indonesia. Fantastic. Uh, why are you here? Learn more about poverty. Learn more about poverty? How about somebody towards that side of the room? Uh, my red jacketed friend. What's that? For a class credit, I love that answer the best. No. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't expecting that answer. But the deal is, I think that the reason why we're all here today and why we all come together, see, graphically coming together, um, it's because we share a common value about how we relate to poverty and microphones. Check. Can you hear me? Hello? We all right? Okay. This is going to be a lot easier because I was having trouble. I talk with my hands and with the microphone. You can't do that. All right. Why we're here together, this common ethos. The deal is, the reason why we're here, even if it is just for class, we're here because we kind of share a common value about this thing called poverty and that to different degrees, pretty much everybody here refuses to accept the world where extreme poverty exists. And that's where we'll start today, right? I know that at Iowa State, there's a lot of great programs, both international and domestic. And I'm just kind of curious about uh, the folks in the room, just sort of a show of hands. How many of you kind of work on this poverty issue domestically in the United States? And that could be volunteering. It could be maybe a can drive or just anything, yeah? Advocacy. How about international? All right. How about both, right? You know, I, I, this is exactly why I'm 
all groovy with this place, man. You guys are really coming together and creating what us social theorists would call a social movement. And by a social movement, we can kind of go back to the, 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 the classic traditions and the definitions, but in terms of this social movement that you're building, the fact that you're all here together, because there's, how many of you are not in EWB? Mm-hmm, right? And so you're not all here for EWB. You're coming from all sorts of different perspectives, and the thing that binds us is this, this distaste for poverty in our world and the fact that we want to do something about it. Some of us big things, some of us small things, but bottom line, we're all here because we want to do something about it. And we're going to do something, and we do do something about it. But the reason I want to frame this thing that you're doing here at Iowa State as a social movement, because you need to understand the power of what you're doing, right? And the power is in the numbers and all the different backgrounds that you come from. When you think about social movements in the past, our first approach in social theory was coming from Marx, of course, right? When Marx was saying that, yes, yeah, social movement, social transformation will come the day that a whole bunch of poor people and workers get sick of the system and... Basically, burn the place down, right? Take it over. That kind of took, that was kind of what we thought of in terms of how social transformation would work up until the Civil Rights Movement. The Civil Rights Movement changed our ideas about a lot of things, but one of the things that it changed our idea about is in fact social movements and the power of them. Because what we had with the Civil Rights Movements were all kinds of different people with all kinds of different talents, skills, and even interests. But the one thing that brought them together was this challenge of civil rights, achieving civil rights in this country. For those of us that were born around that time or slightly after, I don't think we can imagine the United States as a place without civil rights. It's a core principle in the modern age. But the deal is, civil rights happened because all kinds of different people came together to give their different perspectives, whether it was queer theory, whether it was the anti-nuclear folks, whether it was the American Indians, the First Nations folks, all these people were coming together to fight for civil rights, not because of a bus ride in Montgomery or a bus boycott in Montgomery, that was part of it, but it was this bigger picture. If they all came together to work on this issue, we could work on civil rights for our nation and primarily thinking in terms of African American sort of uh, 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 social movement at this point, but as, as the civil rights movement took off, these people were joining it. Why? Because the more they can contribute to this greater movement, the more each of their individual movements f grows and the more their, their major, their, their group movement grows, right? So the deal is, let's move on. I need to get, get rolling here. We are here because we are part of a social movement to end poverty, right? And the thing that makes us so strong is that we're coming from a whole bunch of different perspectives, whether that might be Engineers Without Borders, or whether it might be somebody else. Who else is here that's working on poverty that's not in Engineers Without Borders, or that's not even an engineer? Like, what do you do? Uh, I work with refugees. Yeah. Right. But the thing that we all have in common, whether we're a teacher, refugee sort of advocate, or an anthropologist, an engineer, is this distaste for poverty. And we're putting all of our alliances, to, we're making an alliance, putting all of our energies together because the more we can put our energies together, the more your cause and your sort of the causes that are in your heart, the more that these will come true. But by giving to this movement, you're making sure that all of our visions can come true, right? The exciting thing is that there's good news. Paul Hawken, any of you read Paul Hawken, right? This book he just, uh, actually not just wrote, it's uh, been out for a couple years, called Blessed Unrest. He has some good news about these things called social movements. The thing that you're doing here is something that other people are doing throughout not just Iowa, not just in the United States, but throughout the world. What's happening is there's this growing number of people coming together to fight poverty. He goes and looks at nonprofits. He says that this ending poverty social movement is perhaps the biggest social movement in world history. And as you can see by the sort of title on his book, he talks about the fact that we didn't see it coming. Something's happened in the past couple decades to where no matter who we are and no matter what skills that we're bringing, we're kind of getting sick of this thing called extreme poverty. And for now, we're starting to do something about it. And when you read Blessed Unrest and you start to see the proliferation of non-governmental uh, non organizations, NGOs, what we start to see is that in fact, this movement is the biggest social movement in the world, and it is making progress in fighting poverty. I just have a couple uh, stats here from his book. 
If you add up sort of the economic activity of NGOs the world over, estimated at about a trillion dollars a year, it's a lot of money. That's almost about, as I'll show in another slide, as much money as the entire global community spends on military budgets in a year, right? And this is NGOs. This isn't governments. This is people like you and you and you coming together at places like this and saying, no, we're going to end poverty. We can't live in a world with extreme poverty. So not only that, you can see 20 million paid employees in all of these NGOs, and that isn't even counting all the volunteerism, right, that supports all these NGOs. And the cool thing about you guys right here is that you are part of this. You are one of these people in this huge, or one of these organizations in this huge social movement, right? And, and the deal is, you're not alone. And I think for you to understand this movement as a social movement, and your activity or your, 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 your participation in it, it's crucial. Because so many times when we're working on a refugee issue, or when we're working on, say, an issue back at home or wherever, we can feel alone. We can feel like the world is against us. We can feel what we're trying to do is impossible, unachievable. But sometimes those feelings tend to go away when we realize there's an awful lot of other people doing the same thing. I'm going to give you some more good news. And hopefully it's that my clicker will start working better. It's not just NGOs that are getting in on this. As the NGOs started to emerge saying, oh, well, we're going to do some refugee stuff. Oh, we're going to do some microfinance stuff. Oh, we're going to work with women's organizations. Oh, we're going to build schools. Oh, we're going we're gonna to make wells. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. As more and more people started to step up to fight poverty in all these different ways, the world governance stepped up. We've got these new Millennium Development Goals, right? Not so new now, but what are the Millennium Development Goals? Help me out. I need some participation. Do you know what these are? Oh, yeah, it's you. Is anybody? Can you help me out? MDGs? Yeah, my friend in the back. Part of it is maternal health, gender equality, and education. Right. So there are these big, huge goals that we have for the entire community, the global community, right? And we chop them up into these eight subdivisions, right? And so we can kind of see maternal health, education. We can kind of see all these different uh, areas that we're trying to work on. The exciting thing is, is they created these Millennium Development Goals for one reason, and that was to end world poverty. But the crazy thing is, they're trying to end world poverty, or at least extreme poverty, in your lifetime, right? They actually said that if we follow our goals, and we achieve our goals, we will end poverty in your lifetime. And if we're on track by the year 2015, we will have achieved some really good things. For example, having the prob having, not having, having, right, 0.5, having the poverty rate, the extreme poverty rate. Let's take a look at how much it's costing to make this initiative work. I mean, they're basically copying the NGO movement. They're saying you can't end poverty by just having an economic program. Poverty is bigger than an economic program. Poverty is the global community. Poverty is maternal health. Poverty is food production. Poverty is uh, education. Poverty is women's rights, right? How much is this going to cost us? Well, when the, World, uh, when the World Bank and the United Nations essentially came together and quantified how much it would cost to do this whole having world poverty, at least extreme poverty, by the year 2015, that's their estimate, 20 billion. That's not 20 billion a year. Think 20 billion dollars, give it to us, we can run this program that we've developed and we can get this thing down to half. Essentially 900,000 poor people now. Universal primary education, they said they could do that for about nine. Gender equality in education, three. Having the AIDS rate adds up to me to about 42 billion. Is it affordable? Well, it depends on your priorities. I have a feeling that if you were born in a village that I work in in Mali or maybe in my friend's village in Indonesia or city in Indonesia, you would probably say, oh, it's affordable. 20 billion? What a deal. Especially when you consider what one country could spend on military again, social security, Medicare. But my favorite, my favorite number is this one right down here. The global expenditure on military expenses, right, or military equipment and, and, and engagement. $1.3 trillion a year. That's 
the, basically the same amount that our NGOs are trying to do. We as NGOs, as non-government organizations, as, as volunteers that are sick of having a world full of poverty or with extreme poverty, if you want to look at our economic sort of power, where is power? Is the global military. You need to be empowered by that. We have the resources, essentially the financial resources, without getting governments involved, to be as strong, at least economically, as the global military. That's pretty impressive to me. So let's see how this is working out, because 2015 is kind of happening soon, right? By my count, it's not too far away. Are we getting there? Well, you guys check out worldmapper.com. It's one of my favorite little waste of time websites, right? This is what the world looks like if we equated the area of a country with the percentage of people living under the poverty line. So if the United States had to sort of shrink or grow depending on how many people in this country were living below the poverty line, we're going to see it on this map. And actually, I don't see it on this map. I can't point to it, but can you see America? The United States, I should say? I mean, Mexico gets bigger than the United States. Take a look at Africa. Take a look at India, Asia, right? I don't know if this is a good idea. I don't know if we're making progress. But in fact, we really are. And it's alarming, especially as an anthropologist that's so critical of sort of big schemes for development. But their numbers are kind of telling me maybe something's working. We have right now, by our estimates in this 2010 figure, 1.4 billion people, or million people, sorry. Well, how do we, or no, it is billion, yes. Getting too hot up here. 1.4 million people. Oh my gosh, I'm getting all my stats messed up. I'm so excited, you guys. Gotta calm it down. All right, 1.4 million people living under the poverty line in 2010, right? In order to reach our goal by having our number when we started this program, we have to get to 900,000 by 2015. 900 see, see, I'm not even looking at my numbers now. Your numbers are wrong. You need to yeah, zero. that's right. I'm, uh, can you tell I'm just uh, flipping out up here? I'm so excited. I need to, I need to slow it down. That's right. But I do stats, which is scary. Right? All right. Anyway, the point is this. We could be a little critical of this. We could also start to say, World Bank, this isn't working. United Nations, this isn't working. But if you take a look at when we started this thing, we're getting there. We are making progress. But that's, again, coming from New York. If you come back to Mali and talk to folks in my, my village, go to the SARS village, talk to them, they're not going to say the same thing. I bet you they're not going to say the same thing with folks that you're working with, right? Take a look at what's actually happening. The rates of people living in extreme poverty throughout the world. And this is only over 10 years. Africa's going up, not going down. As a matter of fact, that statistic, as wrong as it was with the zeros, it turned out that way because in some parts of the world, it is working. Asia, for example. Check out the statistics there. And not all of Asia, right? But if you check out the statistics on Asia, East Asia in particular, you can actually start to see a large, large reduction. But you go to Africa, it's going to go down, right? You go to even Central Europe now. And Central Europe, I mean, this is, uh, these aren't sort of broken down in the same categories that I'm giving you, but Central Europe is also having the same problem. They're, they're not going down with their poverty rates, they're going up with this extreme poverty rate. This is what one of my favorite social theorists, Walter, or Walter Rodney, calls pockets of development. This is what he calls underdevelopment. And this is the voice of the people that we need to start listening to. Walter Rodney came into social theory as somebody living in the so-called third world. I'd venture to say we might want to call it the majority world, right? And so he's living in this majority world, an experience that you know, we don't quite relate to so much uh, if we were growing up here. And he's saying, the more I look at your development and these big plans and these, more, these schemes, it doesn't look like development to me. It's actually under development. Since you've come here to try to help this country grow, get healthy, become self-sustaining perhaps, what a goal. 
since you came here with that goal that you said you had for us, we've gone the other direction. Now we're dependent. Now we're monocropping. We used to have all sorts of biodiversity in our fields. But ever since we switched to cotton to make money, our soil went bad, our economy went bad. Underdevelopment. One of the key issues of underdevelopment is this thing called pockets of development, meaning, oh, there will be development under these great schemes, and we can see the numbers improving, but it's only going to be in a few spots. Because if you really look at what's happening with development, at least in these grander schemes today, it's a lot, it is about sort of income redistribution, but oddly enough, it's doing the exact opposite of what it portends. I would highly recommend how Europe underdeveloped Africa for any of you kind of wanting to hear this voice coming from essentially the majority slash third world, right? The mistake that we had as development theorists and practitioners that Rodney wanted to point out was that we were basically simplifying development into this. That really this is our goal, modernization. Take these people that live in huts and make sure that they are having a life that includes 3D movies with the cool glasses that you get to take home. I know I'm being facetious here, but that's really kind of what we're talking about when we're talking about modernization. They're not like us, make them like us, and then they'll be happy. We tried that. Walter Rodney showed how the more we tried to make this happen, the more we caused trouble for them and the more we caused trouble for us. Which brings us to the point of why we're here. We're with Walter Rodney on this. We're with a lot of social theorists that are critical of development. And we're taking a new approach. And that's what makes me so excited about places like Iowa State, including Iowa State's amazing Engineers Without Border chapter. Right? Today, what I'd like to do is, since you are all involved in some ways with this thing called poverty eradication, I'd like to share with you a couple lessons that I've essentially learned from the Malian farmers that have hosted me for the past, what is it, like 50, 70? I don't even know how many years, right? Uh, 16 years, almost 17 years. I've created a nonprofit organization, as you heard, and I also did projects before that. I do research with plant breeding, collaborative plant breeding, and through all these experiences over the years, these farmers have taught me far more than I could ever teach them, and what I'd like to do is to share a little bit of that knowledge with you. Now, I'm warning you, this isn't going to be as impressive as the formulas you may learn in a stats class. It's not going to be as impressive as sort of uh, one of your sort of structural engineering projects, your mechanical engineering projects. But these are going to be very important. Oh, they're exciting. <laughs> the three lessons, let's talk about them. The first one, enduring cycles of debt. What these folks taught me in this little village in Mali was that I'm not doing my job unless I'm incurring endless cycles of debt. Now that sounds strange because I thought this was about us helping over there and maybe, I don't know, just the charity kind of model, right? The deal is that was how I approached development. When I was a young man just finishing college, like many of you are about to do in a couple months, I joined Peace Corps. And they sent me to Mali. This was before the internet was for us regular people. So I went to my public library and looked up Mali so I could see where it was. My education was so bad in terms of you know, the formal education uh, that apparently it wasn't important to know my world geography. But I learned where Mali was and I decided, all right, now I know where it is. Now I'm going. I'm going to do my mission. I'm going to go and help these poor, poor people. I'm going to use what resources and talents and maybe even uh, 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 the connections that I have to help improve their lives. So I went. Peace Corps volunteer. And you know what? They dropped me off at that village after a few months of training. And as the Land Rover sort of went off into the, into the forest, leaving me in a trail of dust and all the kids sort of running up, right? I realized, oh my God. God, if I'd done the stupid stuff, what am I going to do to help these people? I had a garden when I was a kid. I could grow cucumbers, but these people grow, they, they don't have stores. They grow their own food. And I'm, this, this literature major that loves Kerouac is going to show up after finishing his degree on Kerouac to say, I've come to help you farm. Are you kidding me? 
So I did the best I could, and as kind of a, at least at that point, a fairly humble guy because they made me humble. They taught me how useless I really was. So I thought, what can I do? And I thought, well, you know what? Quit thinking like an American savior, an American Peace Corps volunteer, and just pretend that this is just people in your hometown. What would you do if this is the situation? I said, gosh, I don't know what I would do, but I guess I could help with some of the labor. So really, that's what I spent my Peace Corps doing. I didn't make huge projects to save them. I became an apprentice farmer. I learned how hard it was to grow the food that you eat when you don't have a store. Right? I left Peace Corps. And on the way home, I started thinking about this on that plane ride. And I was like, how odd is it that I go to help these people, and when I leave, I owe more to them than they owe to me? I got to do something about that. So the kid that didn't really like school says, we got to go back to grad school because if I'm going to go back to Molly to do something to help them, I should have skills this time. So I went back to grad school. I studied anthropology and agriculture. Right? Yeah, agriculture. Any ag people here? Come on. Yeah. Come on. Respect for the farmers. Let's make it happen. So, so I got my agriculture on and I started to learn that maybe there was some sort of some like theories, some approaches, some methods, and even some technologies that I might be able to bring to, to this community. And it's not to sort of replace what they're doing, but I'm just saying, now at least I know a little bit about what I'm doing, and so let's have a conversation about what we might do together. So with getting that first trip, going to help, then coming back with a bill, right, with a debt, I go back for my dissertation research. Now I'm going to do it. I'm going to do this awesome research project. I'm going to do collaborative plant breeding. We're going to get all sorts of new varieties into this village. And then this is going to feed science. It's going to be great. But bottom line, for once, I'm going to be able to pay off that debt. About six months before I was about to leave to go back home and write the dissertation, get the degree, and then hopefully the job, and then publications, and all these other great things, I started to realize, they tricked me again. The bill got larger. I went to help them again, and this time I had skills. But this time, I took my skills, and we did awesome work. But from that awesome work, they maybe have some new sorghum varieties. And a lot of funny stories about this crazy long hair that comes and visits them every once in a while. But that was about it. What did I get out of that? What did I get out of that? Well, it might sound sort of petty to you, but I get opportunities like this. This is a blast for me, coming to meet people of common, of common interests and common cores, right? Being able to catch up with an old friend, meeting another new friend, right? This is a blast. But I also get other things. Like I said, publications. I got, I've had a couple really good jobs, too. right? And I tell you, every time I've got one of these jobs, they always tell me, we just love that stuff that you're doing in Mali. It's the month. They're, they're getting me my jobs now, right? Cycles of debt. They continue and they continue. So what we decided to do, we're going to build a school. So before I left, this time, this time I'm going to get them. They gave me the bill before I left, right? Not really a bill. But I realized I was getting into this deeper cycle of debt. And so I realized, all right, we're going to finish this right now. I called home, right? We've got to raise some money, Mom. got to raise some money, Dad. Get the friends together. We've got to build. Actually, the first goal was we've got to put in a pump at their little, little they had a little sort of uh, mini school there, sort of made out of uh, mud brick. We can make a pump for them so they can have some clean water for the school. They can have a garden and, and all kinds of, this will be good. Went home. I didn't go home, but the call, the, the call went home. And the next thing I know, we're selling Cleveland Browns t-shirts for the Bougainy Browns backers, Bougainy being a city in Mali. Because when I told my friends and the leaders of Mali, very hush-hush, not for the whole community, just the leaders, we're going to get some money. We're going to put in a pump because you've done so much for me. My community wants to do something for you. My community back in America wants to show you how grateful they are for what you've done for me as one of their sons. Everybody's getting happy. But then I said, so they're going to give us money. We're going to make a pump. They're like, give us the money. They wouldn't accept it unless the people that were giving the money got something in return. So this idea of selling t-shirts to make money to build the pump, that was OK. But to just give the handout, they really didn't want it. I'm sure there were some people in the village that I could have convinced. But the leadership was saying, eh, we're a little uncomfortable with that. Maybe this comes along with being there for a long time, right? But the deal is, instead of raising $1,000 to put in our little uh, our, our, our pump repair thing, uh, we ended up with $10,000 in three months. 
We had Pittsburgh Steelers, and those of you that, you know, football, Pittsburgh Steelers, that's our rival, right? We had Pittsburgh Steelers fans that would write to my mom on email, because there was internet by that time, and they would say, we hate your team, we really don't care for the t-shirts, but we love this school idea, here's 15 bucks, give the shirt to a kid. Right? So people from all over, we had them from all over the world. The bottom line was, I went to try to repay this debt and then we even rebuilt this school. But then by rebuilding the school, guess what happened again? I was tricked. Fell more into debt. Not only this time did it improve my life, but improved my family's life. It improved my friend's life. We had all these friends that sort of have gone different directions from our family that suddenly they read about this in the local paper. Bam! We're all back together and we're meeting, we're having a good time and we're raising money and we're building a school in Mali! By the time we got done with this, we all felt like a million bucks, we felt happier, we had new friends, we had old friends, and actually, I'll be honest about my own family, we were never sort of a fighty family, but we really connected, and we've never been as close since we've done this. The debt continues. Well, I figured I might as well let go of the cycle of debt, and instead, I'll just build this nonprofit. If creating a school took only three months of work, and really all it was was selling some Cleveland Browns t-shirts, and I'm proud to spread that propaganda in Mali, then let's do it again. So I said to all my friends, in three months we built a school. Do you think we could do 10? If one's easy, let's do 10. And so that's really where we are right now. And when I get to Mali this summer, we'll actually start construction on the final nine. <laughs> we did one to learn, switched our methodology, and now we're ready to go. Compressed earth brick for those of you uh, sort of structural engineers out there. Um, second lesson, follow the momentum. They're not all as long as the first one. I rant, digress. My favorite follow the momentum sort of anecdote from my work with these folks in Mali comes from women's groups, women's collectives. It was a couple years into my, uh, past my, my Fulbright, we had... Um, what was it? Yeah, it was two years past the Fulbright. It was, African Sky was sort of coming along. And I went up north to a brand new village because I had heard there was an amazing group of self-advocates for people with disabilities called Jigia. And Jigia in Bamana Khan kind of means like oneness or the power of one or unity, right? And so this was a group of people with disabilities that created their own organization, NGO, Paul Hawken, right? And they were trying to do things to help themselves. They were advocating for each other. So for example, if somebody, some mother had just had a child with some sort of developmental or physical disability, the mother now had an organization that they could go to and say, what can I do? And this person would say, well, you know what? There's a really good doctor in the next town over. We'll go talk to him. We'll make sure that whatever meds you need, whatever you need. It was great. And it's all them. It's this, this is an outside organization. I just sped up there, and I went to go meet him. And you know what? We met, and we started a little relationship. But to end that story quickly, after about four years, I went to go check up on a project that they did with a group in New York. Other people, disability, with, uh, disability advocates um, that, that basically did the same thing, but in New York State. And I actually discovered that these people the leadership had essentially stolen about 4,000 of these dollars from New York. This wasn't a very happy moment. It wasn't my money, but I still felt responsible for kind of helping with the connection. So I was kind of down, but while I was down and thinking about it, two women came up to me and said, hey, we've got a proposal. We want to make soap, but we need a little money to get started. I said, well, talk to me about it. She said, well, here, read this. She gave me a proposal with budgets. And she wanted 200 bucks to buy all the materials and make this first batch of soap. I said, why not? Jiggy, it didn't work out. Let's try these folks. I came back the very next time because I said, I'll double down. I'll give you the same amount again if you can just show me the books, whether you win, lose, come even. Just show me, show me that it's working, that things are going all right so I can try to help out a little bit with the finances, but just show me how it worked. They actually, when I came back, showed me the books, and I went to give them money, and they said, over there, my name's Solo. They said, Solo, we don't need your money now. We just showed you the books. You see, gave us the 200, we made money, we're gonna buy more, and we're gonna do it again. But this is awesome, this is, this is, this is exactly what development should be, right? The funny thing was, is I went back a year later, and they had to have a very important meeting. Solo, you have to come, we have a very important meeting today, and you have to be there. Anytime I hear that, I'm like, oh crap, what did I do? Right? They said, we've been doing some cost, sort of costing uh, research, and we think that 
maybe this soap making is not really that good of an idea. It costs a lot of money to get these materials. And it's a hell of a lot of work. And you know, we're not sure that the profits we're making are really worth it. So we'd like to make peanut butter. Do you mind? So it's not my money, it's your profits. Remember, we established that. So do what you want to do. So well, could you just please just help us, like talk to us, encourage us? And so I was like, yeah, whatever, but this is your deal. You guys want to make peanut butter, make peanut butter. So they went to a crop that's all over the local fields. And they became premium producer, or I should say producers of premium peanut butter. It's about... Uh, Altogether, 25 women at this, this point. They just meet together once a month. They make a crap load of peanut butter. They save half for their families. And typically at this point, before you get about one or two days after that batch was made, it's gone. Because these women are mothers. And they want to make great peanut butter for their children because their children are eating it. So they only select the best and the biggest of peanuts. They toss out the bad ones, right? They don't toss them out, but they don't put them in the peanut butter, right? It was amazing, uh, an amazing experience. The thing was, is after they did this and started to have money, they started to say, well, we'd like to do some other things. For example, some of the women in our group don't really know how to read or write, and they can't do math, and, and, and so it puts a burden on the rest of us, so we're thinking maybe we could sponsor some literacy classes. Could you help us with that? What a good idea, right? Follow the momentum. Right? And so we did. We put together this literacy class, and you know what? We did it a couple times in a row, and the next thing I know, the same women that started with this success story, they came to me after I had done a few different types of this. I was doing like a one-month program after the labor. I was doing like a, a night program, maybe once a week for about a, a, a two-month or three-month period. They came up with this plan. I said, we've done this budget thing again, just like we did with the soap, and we figured that we could get 50 women to do two classes a day. Oh, I'm sorry, 100, because we're going to do this two. We're, we did two versions of it, so I just made it up. Their original proposal was we'll do uh, one class two days a week uh, for a whole year, essentially with holidays you know, off. Um, and it's going to cost us about 1000 bucks. The idea was so good, and the demand was so strong, I said, can we do two of those? Right? And so we had basically two classes meeting, and they met two times a week for the full year, and this was the cost. Right? Break it down. I've got even better news. Sure, the cost, if it's 100 women, was about 18 bucks a woman to give this education for a year, a sustained education for counting and basic writing and reading in the local language, Bamana Khan. We're not trying to get you know, people to be speaking French. That's not going to help in the village so much. We want Bamana Khan so they can read and write and do their marketing stuff. Take a look at the bottom part. About 650 of, that do of, those, of this funds actually came from them as an in-kind donation. They made sure that they found a classroom that they we could get for free and not have to pay for it. And they actually essentially abused their Peace Corps volunteer to get free books. Right? So really, instead of it costing 18 bucks per woman times 100 to do this project for a year, it brought our cost down to around 11. Follow the momentum. Right? The last part of this is my most, ex uh, I would say, probably one of the best success stories of African Sky's short history. The same women again. I work with a lot of women's organizations doing kind of the similar, the similar work. The deal this time was the folks in my original village, my original host, uh, Peace Corps host village, and the women of this peanut butter group, right? I've been working with them and I'm thinking, ooh. They live an awful far away, you know, they're really far away from each other, but they need to talk to them and they need to talk to them because they can make soap and they do it cheap and they can make really great peanut butter, right? And they're really doing stuff, they're doing literacy class. I'm like, they need to talk. Like, I don't need to be doing things, I just need to be putting them together. And so the idea was, I'm going to rent a van and I'm going to take around 10 of these women from the village of Dison and take them up to Markula and just walk away and let them hang out. So we started to put this in action and then the women of Dison said, ooh, what about the women over there? Because we'd like to invite them. They've wanted to do soap, and we haven't helped them yet, but why don't they come, and then we, you know, they could learn too. Oh, People in Markla said the same thing. What about them? What about them? By the time we got done, we had all kinds of women. We had, there were 100 women coming from all over Mali, and plus another 100, of women, 100 women that were from the immediate area coming together for what we ended up having, the Skirt Power Meeting. The first ever annual Mothers and Daughters Conference, right? Or Mothers and Daughters Summit in Mali. 
It was an amazing success. The local radio station actually showed up and said, would you mind if we broadcast this? Yeah, okay. Right? So they broadcast it, but then they said, we can actually tape it for you so all of the women's groups can have a cassette tape to take home to the people that couldn't come. I mean, follow the momentum. It works out for itself, right? Um, I won't even go into more detail about it. You can go online to our African Sky website to figure that out. Um, there's a lots of good stuff about the, the summit, but it just happened, so I'm really hopped up about it. And again, all we did was follow the momentum. It started with helping these women with $200 on a soap project, right? And they basically drove the rest. Um, the other follow the momentum, I'm going to go quickly, had an EWB group that replaced a pump, came back about five years later and realized the new pumps and the parts were basically getting destroyed. Um, if you can't quite tell what's going on there, this will tell you what's happening. This is not a good thing for a pump. We did a little cultural analysis, thanks to the anthropologist in the group, figured out what's going on here because we've been really working hard to have this not happen. And uh, actually I found that amongst especially the younger women in the community who are charged with the, the responsibility of getting this water, there was this kind of belief, this belief that the louder noise that you could make with the pump, the more effective it will push the water out, right? It makes kind of sense. It makes sense to me. Bing! 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 Right? I said, engineers, we have a bigger problem. What can we do? Well, the folks in, in Dison really loved the project. They loved the volunteers. But the EWB came up with a pretty simple solution. We went to a, a machinist that we know in the capital city. He made us some really, really strong uh, um, iron uh, bars, essentially. And we just put a, a fence around it. And so now, guess what? They can still go clang and then go clang, but instead of it costing $1,000 to replace the pump, I can go back to our machinist and for about 10 bucks, 15 bucks, depending on what's broken, put in another one of these, right? Follow the momentum. It's all coming from them. They were the ones that gave us the idea. Move on. The, uh, the last part of this follow the momentum is that the volunteers that came over to help with the pump eventually because they came back and other people came to work on the same project, they started teaching. And there was a group of people that was responsible for fixing these pumps. But the crazy thing was is that the engineers and this tech team, this local tech team, just really got along well. They came together. And now EWB, at least my EWB partners from other universities that do this pump project, they're out of it. They're done. Because now we have the first ever, first ever mobile pump repair team. Two weeks ago, I just dispatched them from Dison in the south of Mali all the way up to Dogon country to a, a, a village that has had a broken water pump for seven years. They've been drinking essentially collected water and really just bad water for seven years. We went in. We didn't fix it the first time, but they're going back next weekend. We needed to get a winch because it's like meters and meters down and very, very tough. Anyway, move on. I'm just getting into uh, too much detail here. I'm going to move on a little bit. The last one is the simplest one, learning to take. This is another one of these mini stories. I know I tell lots of long stories. This one is shorter. Learning to take. Sitting in the village after a couple years before African Sky was even born, the elders called me to the meeting, just the male elders. Solo, we have a very important meeting. We need to talk to you. It's like, oh, fine. And now I'm finally getting kicked out of the village. What are, you know, I'm, this is it. The deal was they brought me into this little special, it's a ceremonial kind of house that we have in the village, and they basically put it, on the, put it right out there. They said, dude, you've given us an awful lot with the stuff and these projects and these researchers and all these people that have been coming around and, and the work that you do, and this is great. We love it. But you know what? We're kind of upset with you. Like, ooh, what did I do? They said, you are so quick to give whatever you have to us. But when we try to do that same thing to you, you refuse. I said, well, yeah, because, you know, I'm trying, I have a lot, and there's not as much here, and I want to give that extra back. And like, do you know what it feels like to give somebody a gift for, th for helping you, and that person says, oh, no, it's OK, you just keep that. I said, you're going to have to learn to take from us if you're going to give to us long term. And you know what? They're right. But the questions that we can sort of wrap this talk up with are right up here. How is it 
that by taking from these people, you can help your hosts. What do you think? Any ideas? By taking things from these poor people, their gifts, how can you help them? Any ideas? Yes. Self-esteem is it's spot on, right? They become not a client, not a development object. You know what they just became? A friend and a peer. A peer can stand up to another peer and say, that idea is crap. But an engineer and a very, very poor farmer, an engineer that came from another country, that's not going to happen. Right? It gives them ownership and it gives them pride, right? And it makes them realize that this is an even relationship. They become partners. But how is this going to help you? Taking from them, how does it help you? Once you get over the fact that you're taking from somebody that you really didn't want to in the first place. Can it help you? It's pretty much the converse of what I just said. Right? What's that? Humility. Humility. We don't have to answer every question. We're not in charge of the whole world. And as a matter of fact, it might be a better place if sometimes we could back off and be the smaller person, right? Exactly it. The last one, what can it do for science? It's an easy one for me. It's called perspectives and priorities. Just like in the beginning of this talk today, I made the sort of comparison between what nonprofits the world over are raising, spending, and putting out into the economic system in a year and what the global military is raising, spending, and putting out in a year. And they're almost the same. If we come from a country where we're used to having a big military like that, maybe that makes sense, that priority. But if you grew up in Desan, I think you'd find that that's obscene. And frankly, that's how they can help us. I'm not even going to do my one finger, can't lift a stone because I just have to give you my parting tip. We talk an awful lot about helping them and what we can do, is, especially as engineers in their communities. What can we do to help these people? What can we do in their village? There's something that we often forget to talk about. And that is, if we really want to make poverty history, it's not all about them and bringing them up to us, because it's not up, for one. It's about our consumption. The more we consume, the less they can consume. So I would love to challenge you with this Make Poverty History Challenge, and that would be for every idea that you have that's out there to bring some new technology and new idea to a faraway place, I would love if you could complement that with what you might do here in the United States in your own personal private life in terms of consumption to try to make this thing, this game, this life, this world a little bit more even. That would be my final tip to you as people trying to make poverty history. Thank you very much. Sorry, I rant, but I guess we can have a few questions if you have them. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. We are going to have a question and answer here. I'll just go and clip this mic in the back and, or you can raise your hand. And um, Also, I'd like you to know that there will be more Poverty Awareness Week events this week. Um, tomorrow, SHOP is holding a food drive here in the MU. And there's also a charity concert on Thursday night at Zeke's. So, questions? Or classes, or homework, or <laughs> projects. <laughs> I could have taken those 30 seconds to give you the one finger can't lift a stone parable, right? Yeah. Oh, you have a question. Yes, my dear friend. What's your name? My name is Brittany. Brittany, hi. Hi. Um, I'm not sure this will be entirely relevant to everybody in the room, but... Um, I'm wondering if you do any work with the Moringa tree. Uh-huh. Yes, we do. Okay. That's fantastic. Do you? Yes, I do. Tell me about what you're up to. Um, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Niger, actually. Uh-huh. So, our neighbor. Yes. Yeah. And I spent a lot of time in Mali. Well, a little bit of time in Mali. Yeah. Um, but I was just interested to hear a little bit about that. Probably 
Sure. Privately, I guess. Well, I'd be glad. What we can do is I'll give you a quick, immediate answer that would be more compelling to the whole group, and then maybe uh, I'll give you my card afterwards, send me an email, and we'll talk more about it, and I'll that send you a couple good. project reports. Okay. Right? Uh, but Moringa tree, why do you think the Moringa is so important for Niger and Mali? What is it? Tell us out. You do the first part, I'll do the second. Okay. Um, in countries like Mali, I know definitely in Niger, um, the child mortality rate, so children under five, um, is one in five which is tremendous. And with the birth rate, that means that every mother in Niger, and probably, again, it's similar in Mali, will lose a child in her lifetime. Um, and the top three causes of child mortality in Niger, at least, are um, simple malnutrition, malaria, um, and then dehydration from yeah. having diarrhea from contaminated food and water. Mm -hmm. So what I did was um, a big Moringa tree project because Moringa has incredibly nutritious leaves. Um, the leaves have a gram for gram comparison, gives them, they have more calcium than milk, more potassium than bananas. What yeah, and, and it grows great yeah. in these climates and that it it's loves, hard to grow anything. The, it loves the desert. That's it right. Hates, like, it loves being hot and dry, which is basically what we've got going for us over there. That's right. So. Well, thank you. That's all. I think just so that everybody can know what this Moringa tree is, because it, it's, it's been around, but mm -hmm. it's kind of getting really exciting right. now, right? Yeah. Uh, so what we're doing at African Sky, quite simply, we have a program that um, it's kind of an informal Peace Corps partners program. Mm -hmm. And what I do is I go and talk to Peace Corps volunteers to kind of help them in their field work and stuff like this. But what we also do is we put out this call for applications. And we say, you got an idea? that's kind of small, a test idea that you'd like to see if it could grow, some, you need some seed money before you apply for a bigger grant, mm -hmm. send me an email, give me a budget, keep it under $500, and we'll talk. And so I actually have worked with three different Peace Corps volunteers in Mali who have done a Moringa project, and in our summit, we actually had not the Peace Corps volunteer, but the women who are carrying on that Peace Corps volunteers Moringa project <laughs> share that whole project and seed with every single woman at the conference. Cool. Awesome stuff. Talk Thank to me you. about Moringa. Thank yes, you very much. I will. Much. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Any other questions? I think. Oh, yeah. We, oh, no. That's no. Dan. <laughs> the, the lights are bright. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I'm sure Dr. Lacey would be happy to stick around after. Yeah. Come in and chat if you'd like. And the last thing I'll just say to the group is this sounds silly, and you have plenty of awesome people, you know, two right here in the room that go to Mali all the time and do some good work. Uh, but if. You also want to come by and check out some African Sky stuff. I would be happy and honored to have any of you come and visit uh, for the short or the long term. Yeah? All right. Peace, love, rock and roll. All right. <laughs>